Hi, welcome. It's Dr. Sherry here. I want to show you one of my favorite panels to run. This is called an Adrenal Stress Index. And like the name says, it has to do with your stress and measuring your stress hormones. In particular, your cortisol, which is your main stress hormone. Now, I think of ordering this test across the board for many different reasons. However, most importantly, I think about it for sleep issues, energy issues, fatigue in particular. If somebody has um, a lot of anxiety, there's something that happens in the evening where people will uh, complain of this feeling of being wired but tired. So they're exhausted, but they still feel stimulated. This is a big adrenal type issue. If I have people that have sex hormone issues, uh, so they're not producing enough estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, those types of things, they'll have menstrual irregularities, menopausal type symptoms. An adrenal stress profile can um, can be very helpful in these kinds of cases. So I really like to see it for one reason is we can assume everybody has lots of stress in their life. To be alive in our modern society is to have stress, but how that stress affects your unique physiology is going to vary from person to person. So I think it's really important to take a look and see exactly what your stress load is like. And then we know how to, from a nutrition standpoint, we know how to manipulate the cortisol pathway a little bit so that you can experience the health and the vitality that you deserve. So here's a, it's, we call it a four-point adrenal profile. So there's specific times throughout the day where you take a salivary sample. Now hormones, cortisol is a hormone as are other hormones. We always think of different sex hormones in particular. It's very controversial how we measure hormones and you'll see this from different practitioners. Some you know swear by blood, some by urine, some by saliva. It's very practitioner dependent on how somebody measures different hormones. However, when it comes to cortisol, it's very well understood that cortisol is best measured through saliva. It's not bound by a protein in the blood. Now, if you go to your conventional provider and you ask your conventional provider, provider for a cortisol test, they will measure it by blood. And if that number is either really high or really low, you're going to be diagnosed with something called Addison's disease or Cushing's disease. Now, in this type of format, we are looking at Anything between Cushing's and Addison's that is contributing to ill health or, or suboptimal health. And, uh, and we feel like there's a, a large variety of people who experience different symptoms, but they not, might not fall in the category of having overt Cushing's or overt Addison's disease, which are pretty, pretty significant um, diseases to have. So we know readily that cortisol is, is measured, should be measured by saliva. It's very reliable this way. It also makes for uh, easy uh, collecting, and it also makes for a more variable profile. So if we were just going to do a one-point cortisol and see what it is in the morning, that's good information. But getting a four-point throughout the day, we can really look and see what your pattern is going to be like. So I have um, somebody's uh, adrenal stress profile I put up here to show you what it looks like. And basically, once you send in your four-point um, salivary samples, it puts it onto a graph here. So you can see what your total cortisol or stress load is like. Um, the green box here, or the green graph, is where you want to fall. So ideal scenario is we wake up and we have a good amount of cortisol, enough to get us out of bed, for us to feel vibrant and healthy and energetic and ready for the day. And then throughout the day, it sort of takes a dip. It's a nice slow dip down around noon, and it continues to fall between noon and four. Now, people will often complain around this time period, usually two to four, where they experience a crash. So this is when somebody needs coffee or sugar. They're falling asleep at their desk, and their cortisol is often taking too big of a hit at that time. So it's coming down in its natural pattern, but it's coming down too sharply, too quickly, and that's where people start to have symptoms. Then past four, the cortisol comes even lower down to midnight where cortisol is nice and low. You get a deep, restful sleep, go to sleep, wake up, and then the pattern starts all over again where you have um, re-energized, your hormones are back on track again, and you have good cortisol for the morning. So we don't want to see this pattern too high or too low. What typically happens once, you, once somebody's coming in with different symptoms 
uh, they usually have gone through many, many years of a hyper cortisol state, a high cortisol state, and they tend to come into what we call a burnout state or a lowered cortisol state. And that's what's happened with this patient. You can see here's where she is in the morning. She's waking up tired and groggy, not a lot of energy for the day. She takes that curve down to noon. Um, but really, she's almost flatlined here. She never really comes up to an optimal cortisol pattern. Um, she's, she's across the board here at four, and then she is dipping down a tiny bit at midnight, but she's never really getting um, energized, or she's never uh, really uh, recovering in the evening with her cortisol. It's not coming back at night like it should. Uh, she's just completely flatlined here. This is what we call a stage three type of adrenal fatigue, and this is a long-standing pattern that's been going on many, many years, um, and she's, she's just she's not feeling great in, in lots of different ways, particularly her energy is just bottomed out. She's, she can hardly function from day to day because the energy is so low. And you can see here what her cortisol load is. It's a 13. It's quite, quite low. We want her in 22 to 46, but the optimal range is somewhere you know in there, sort of in the middle of the 22 to, to 46. So she's pretty far from this. Then the test goes down a little bit. Um, it explains some of the inducers of cortisol, things that intuitively we know, um, but also it's nice to look at. Anything, blood sugar dysregulation, chronic pain, chronic inflammation, any kind of mental or emotional stress, and then that type A personality, that overachiever, that person that's in a go, go, go pattern, all of this starts to... Um, push that cortisol pathway, and it's sort of a vicious cycle because once the cortisol pathway is pushed so much, it circles back around and continues to create some of these problems, more blood sugar dysregulation, more inflammation, more pain, more stress, more sympathetic output. So really important to get on top of this. And as I tell patients all the time, you can start to work on a nutritional approach to correcting a pattern like this. But at the end of the day, if you want to really recover from adrenal fatigue, you really have to deal with some of these underlying issues that are perpetuating this cortisol release. So we go down a little further and they put this panel together. It's a comprehensive panel. It looks at not just cortisol, your stress hormone, but it looks at the precursors of the stress hormone and anything that we know impacts adrenal health. So it's a very comprehensive panel. The next thing we look at is DHEA. DHEA is produced from the adrenal glands and it is your master hormone. Uh, it turns into all of your other hormones. It's often um, tagged as the anti-aging hormone because it naturally declines as we age. Uh, but because it's directly produced from the adrenal glands, it gives you another indication or another way to look at adrenal health and see how well those adrenal glands are functioning. So you can see this person, she is technically in the uh, normal range for DHEA, but she's very borderline low here. And when you pattern that with the cortisol that we looked at earlier, you can get a sense of what level of adrenal fatigue she's in and, and it stages it here and puts it in a graph for us and you can see again she is at this low adrenal fatigue um, type of phase. She's, she's bottomed out with her cortisol production and almost her DHEA production as well. Then we come down and we look at fasting insulin and we do a carbohydrate challenge. So part of when you take this test you're giving a specific amount of carbohydrates to take to intake at a certain time and then we look and we see what's the blood sugar doing without food and how does it handle your blood sugar load. Part of the reason this is really important is because your stress hormone cortisol is directly responsible for helping you to stabilize your blood sugar. So key aspect here is one, if cortisol is too high for too long or it starts to, to bottom out, you're no longer able to control blood sugar very well. And the vicious cycle is as the adrenals get more fatigued, uh, you have a m increased uh, difficulty maintaining blood sugar. So it really is a vicious cycle. And we have to get an idea here of how well you are handling a sugar load. And you'll see this person in particular, she's not doing well. Her fasting insulin's low, but when she eats a meal, uh, she's probably taking out too much insulin. Is um, it, Insulin's on high alert, and it comes back down too low. So she's definitely not able to go for long periods of time without eating. She probably gets lightheaded, shaky, irritable. Uh, she probably craves sugar and carbohydrates because the body's out of balance, and it, it's, it's asking 
for some kind of blood sugar st stabilization through sugar, but that's not really what the body needs for long-term health. So it graphs it out a little bit here, and it goes into a little bit of description about carbohydrate load. Then we come down and we look at what we call the 17-hydroxyprogesterone, and it's a precursor to cortisol. So we can look back and we can say, well, her cortisol is very low. Now, how much of the precursor does she have? So it, again, it gives us a little bit of indication of hormonal activity and how well and for how long has she been making cortisol. We come down even a little bit further and we are looking at the total salivary secretory IgA. That's a mouthful, I know. Uh, but this is the immune system in the mucosa. It's the immune system that's in the sinus tract, in the vaginal tract, the bladder, the digestive tract. And it really takes a hit when there is a chronic cortisol, high stress exposure. It definitely depresses the immune system, the immune barrier in the mucosa. So what does this mean? One, again, it tells us how long Cortisol has been around um, in, a, in a dysregulated pattern. It tells us the effect that some of cortisol might have had on the immune system. And it's why people that um, produce too much cortisol for too long often end up with immune type of issues. Autoimmune diseases for one. Food sensitivities are another one. You can imagine if somebody's uh, secretory IgA is low, they have a lowered immune system in the digestive tract, well, they've lost that ability to um, properly identify or for the body to handle certain foods. So we have to build up this secretory IgA. We have to look and see if there are any kind of food sensitivities, any kind of food reactions, any kind of digestive issues um, associated with this low secretory IgA. Okay. And then we come down here on that same topic. Um, this is the last part of the, this uh, particular panel, and it's the gliadin antibodies. Again, we're looking at secretory IgA. So gliadin is gluten. Uh, gluten's a big um, popular phase fad right now, but it is something that's very real for people that have gluten issues. And whether that's celiac or gluten sensitivity, it's, it's definitely a real phenomenon for these people. So we measure the gluten antibodies just because we know how, um, how much adrenal impact uh, gluten can cause for somebody, how much uh, uh, dysregulation in the adrenal glands this can, this can cause. And also, it's sort of a screen for other food sensitivities. So certainly, if gluten's high, we're going to get somebody on a gluten-free diet for a period of time and see what changes. But we also are going to be more apt to look at other food sensitivities, especially when we look back and see that barrier, that secretory IgA, that is so low. So we'll want to definitely screen for different types of food reactions. Um, this lab gives us a, a type of restoration plan. I think the restoration plan is very much going to depend on the person's symptoms. Um, it's going to depend on their current state of health, their current diet, exercise, lifestyle. Um, and then we can put it in perspective and really see what somebody needs in order to create optimal adrenal health. So I hope this wasn't too overwhelming or too much information. Uh, it's a great panel. It really provides us with an individualized type approach to get somebody feeling really good. We all want our hormones to work really well. We want to sleep well. Uh, we don't want to have that wired, tired feeling. We want great energy. Um, and we want to have ideal blood sugar control, which also means ideal weight, body fat, and muscle mass proportion. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks.